Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is My New York. Today, the captivating story behind an immortal, popular song and the broken-hearted young woman who wrote it. I'll never smile again until I smile at you. That song ignited Frank Sinatra's ride to stardom in 1940. In today's jargon, both he and the song went viral. Ruth Lowe, a talented Toronto pianist, wrote the words and music, but she didn't stop there. Until I Smile at You is the story of her unique place in Frank Sinatra's career. She also wrote his timeless theme song. The author tells all next. Peter Jennings, welcome to the program. Good to see you. Good to see you, Tony. Thanks for having me on. A wonderful story you tell about this uh, remarkable woman, Ruth Lowe. Who was she? Uh, let's, well, let's go back to the early days. Sure. Ruth was a young Canadian girl, marvelous piano player. Her father uh, died when she was very young, and she had to leave school and go out and get a job playing piano in order to uh, bring money in for herself, her ailing mother, and her sister. And that led, actually, to her being picked up by the Ina Ray Hutton all-female band called, wait for it, the Melodiers. I love that. <laughs> they were pretty big back then. They right? were big. They were big. And uh, anyway, she went on the road with them for about three years, touring across North America. Eventually, she lands in uh, Chicago, where she quits the band to marry a handsome song plugger by the name of Harold Cohen. But within the first year of their marriage, Harold dies totally unexpectedly. Yeah, and this is how she comes to write uh, I'll Never Smile Again. I mean, here's yeah. a young woman, she's 25, I guess, 23. 24? 23, a widow. Yeah, right? and the, first, the love of her life goes into the hospital for a routine operation and, and never comes out. That's right, yeah. She was devastated. And she moved back to Toronto, moved in with her mother and sister. Her uh, younger sister, Muriel, who I interviewed, by the way, for the book, and she said she was very concerned about her big sister because she was just lost in grief. Yeah, you, well, you say in the book that her sister, she told, her sister told you that Ruth said to her, I just don't think I'll ever smile again. That's right. She uttered that one night, which was a devastating thing to say. But Ruth was smart enough to know, you know, there could be a song there. And literally, her, her sister Muriel, or Mickey, as she was known to friends, she told me that that night the song just poured out of Ruth, words and music. And Ruth was smart enough to kind of broaden it a bit to take it away from her own personal grief into more of a romance that hadn't flourished. I'll never smile again until I smile at you. I'll never laugh again what good would it do wow the anguish is is palpable in it is. that song yeah and and tony the the thing one of the things that uh, kind of was a challenge for me as a writer was here is a song which leaps ahead of every other song in 1940 to become number one on Billboard's uh, chart for an unheard of 12 weeks. But this almost dirge-like, slow, melancholy song, how did it move ahead of all the other songs of the day, which, I mean, you'll know, they were like Fantasy and Pennsylvania 65,000 and the Woodpecker song. They're all these happy songs. The, the dance band songs were, were up-tempo, joyous, Absolutely. fun thing. That was the whole point of getting the bands to come to your town or city, get everybody out dancing. 
Well, just on just before we leave that point, I love the quote you have from in the book from Bernie Topin, who's uh, who's uh, Elton John's lyricist, who who right. described the song "I'll Never Smile Again." He said it's an absolute exhalation of despair and sadness. It sure yeah. is. And and Bernie told me he said, you know, I would much rather write a song about sadness than about happiness. But uh, still, it was it was a. Uh, it was a song that uh, called into the heart. Um, but the interesting thing is, yes, I talked to Bernie Taupin, I talked to Sir Tim Rice, Alan Bergman, uh, Chuck Renner, all sorts of people, because I wanted to get their take. And they said it was such an excellent song, and excellent songs, regardless of their mood, will always run to the top of the pack. Well, so you got a great quote from Nancy Sinatra about mm -hmm. why this song succeeded. Yeah, the it perfect was, uh, song at the perfect time, sung by the perfect singer. <laughs> she was, yeah, perfect song. Uh, the perfect singer, I think, is important in the sense that, you know, we we know Frank Sinatra, we all know Frank, but in 1940, we didn't fully know who this guy was and, and the talent he had for interpreting lyrics. Probably never been anyone better than, at that than him. Absolutely, Tony. And he was really just uh, kind of seen with the Pied Pipers doing the odd uh, little solo. But Dorsey, uh, Tommy Dorsey, he was a very smart operator. He ran what they called the General Motors of the band business. Yeah. And he didn't get to be number one without being a very smart promoter. So he recognized he had something in this big ear Italian boy with a seductive voice and said, um, Let's give him some solos to do in this uh, mournful song. Let's get to how the song, uh, how how Ruth actually got the song to mm. Tommy Dorsey. Yeah, Ruth, um, she had been on the road with the Ina Ray Hutton band, and she had discovered that Ina Ray's sister, June, was uh, a member of the Pied Pipers, Dorsey's singing group. June was also dating the guitar player for Dorsey's band. Uh -huh. so Ruth is back in Toronto and the band comes to Toronto for a gig. Ruth meets up with June, gets introduced to her guitar player boyfriend. And Ruth at this point has a marvelous recording of the song that had been done by Percy Faith, who worked on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation at so that point. So she worked, Ruth worked at this time on, on CBC, Canadian Broadcast, and, yeah. and Percy Faith too, exactly. if I understand it correctly. And Percy becomes aware of this song, loves it, and says, let me record it. Yeah, let me put it on the air. He records it, and he hands Ruth a disc. And Ruth is then able to hand the disc to the guitar player. They play right. it, and he goes, wow, what a song. Uh, let me play this for uh, Dorsey. Now, Dorsey normally gets, you know, bits of short cardboard and pieces of paper with lyric script, you know, put on them. But here he's got the whole CDC orchestra. We're talking woodwinds and brass and strings, and it's a marvelous recording. And of course, Dorsey falls in love with it, and the rest is uh, history. We, uh, we happen to find a, a, a clip of Ruth um, on a a documentary series called the Canadians talking about how she got the song to uh, to Dorsey it's much as what uh, as you say it but it, it'd be interesting just to hear her voice let's listen I knew his guitar player very well and uh, Tommy Dorsey thought it was a marvelous song he asked if he could publish it he also thought Percy Faith was a wonderful conductor and composer and arranger and wanted to uh, hire both of us at the time yeah, he wanted to, <laughs> according to Ruth, he wanted to hire her and Percy Faith. Well, that I hadn't heard before. I did know he wanted to hire Faith, and Percy was not ready to move quite yet. He did eventually, of course. In 1945, he became an American citizen. But um, I don't know that uh, Dorsey wanted to hire Ruth. On the other hand, he was smart enough to know she is easy on the eyes. She's a very good speaker. She's smart. She's fun very talented so he brings her down to new york city and that's where she stays for about three years yeah he uh and he he and sinatra record the song 
Uh, interestingly enough for us here in New York, they recorded it at uh, RCA Studios at 30 Rock. That's yeah. right. Yep. Yep. And it was the second time he had tried to record the song. It was a marvelous record. Uh, over 150 artists worldwide have since recorded it, including, I should tell you, Charlie, uh, David Clayton Thomas, he of Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Oh, yeah. And in fact, I opened the book until I smile at you with uh, David in studio recording on the smile again. Yes. Well, when Dorsey and, and Sinatra and the band and the Pied Pipers recorded it in 1940, the second time, as you say, uh, he must have loved it because I, I love your footnote about the bonus he gave Mr. Sinatra. Yes, he, he, he normally taciturn Tommy Dorsey smiles knowing they've nailed the hit and he gives his star player 25 bucks as a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And as, as you said, I mean, the story just, I, I said in the introduction, uh, in, in, the, in our parlance, this thing went viral. Both Sinatra and the song went viral. I mean, it exploded on the world. And promoter <laughs> Tommy Dorsey, as you say, brings, brings Ruth to New York and installs her at the Astor Hotel and starts a, like a PR campaign for her and the song. Absolutely. She is interviewed on every radio show. She's doing live autograph sessions. Uh, being interviewed in newspapers and magazines. I mean, she was a major hit. And she uh, she got to know Duke Ellington, Lena Horn, Vic Damone, uh, Al Jolson. I mean, everybody uh, who's anybody, she got to know them all. And uh, she had a, um, she wrote a, uh, a newspaper column called The Downbeat, which was, uh, sorry, The Lowdown, uh, which was uh, about jazz. She managed uh, the, um, what's it called? The uh, Murphy Room, I think. The Murray Room, actually, which was a jazz club. So uh, she kept- in New York. York. Yeah, in New York. All of this is in New York. She was in New York from uh, 19, early 1940 to mid-1943. And celebrated, as you say. Mm -hmm. um, and at this time, I get the sense that the backstory of how this song came about gets enhanced or hyped. Um, what can you tell me about that? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, if you go on the internet, there are all sorts of misinformation pieces about Ruth Lowe. And that was a challenge as a writer to kind of work your way through all the, the crap and corruption and get to the essence. Well, but um, one of the stories making the rounds was that her flyboy husband had been killed in action overseas, and that caused her to um, become so devastated and write the song. It, Even Sinatra said that once on. on yeah, the but in fact, that we have Mr. Sinatra saying that. Let's listen yeah. to Frank and his version of the Ruth Lowe backstory. Ruth Lowe, who was a Canadian woman, her husband got killed. He was a Canadian flyer. Right in the beginning of the war, he got killed. She wrote that song and brought it down personally to New York. For tears would fill my eyes. Yeah, so wherever he got that, maybe from Dorsey or maybe... Tony, um, I should tell you, Tommy Dorsey was a pretty tough taskmaster. And if he said we're doing it this way, that's the way it got done. And Tommy believed you, you don't let the truth get in the way of a good story from a promotional standpoint. So um, there are all sorts of rumors that she was American. But I mean, if you think about it, this is 1940, the US didn't even enter World War II until December 41, Pearl Harbor. So mm -hmm. it was well over a year before the uh, United States was even at war. Um, Canada was, so if they attributed to her being Canadian, fair enough, but she didn't have any flyboy husband who was cut down <laughs> yeah. overseas. She had an American song plugger husband who died of kidney ail ailment. <laughs> yeah. Um, the song, I, I don't know, was the song uh, and its popularity enough to, to uh, get the Dorsey banned the invitation to be in that movie, Las Vegas Nights? Uh, apparently it was. And uh, I, think, I think it was Sinatra as well, because 
that was Frank's uh, first of many, many movie appearances. And he gets to um, sing the song before the, uh, before the cameras. I should tell you that when Ruth um, moved to New York, uh, she was one of the very first female songwriters. I mean, you think back to 1940, there is maybe what? Dorothy Fields is a name that comes to mind. But otherwise, it was um, not only men, but groups of men. It was two men typically writing songs, one doing music, one doing lyrics. Yeah, you got you know, rock. If you look at on the Smile again, Ruth was a female who wrote both the lyrics and music. So yeah. she broke all sorts of bounds. Yeah, I'm thinking of Rogers and Hard, uh, Sammy Kahn, Jimmy Van Usen, although they don't go back that far, I don't think. But with George I, 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 yeah. and Irish Harold Arlen with almost anyone and Jerome Kern with anyone. And yeah. Yeah. I get I get the I get the point. And and as you pointed out, that that movie appearance, Las Vegas Nights, was was uh, I guess was Frank's first time on the big screen. It was. It was indeed. This just struck me so um, poignantly. Uh, she writes this song out of despair with the death of her husband. The song just takes over the world and helps guide, propel Frank Sinatra to stardom. Yep. And there's all this uh, activity in New York that you've been talking about. And a couple of years goes by mm -hmm. and uh, go by. And, uh, and all of a sudden she gets a phone call from Frank and he <laughs> has a request. Let's talk about that request. Well, yeah, and, and uh, funnily enough, the, the request is to write his uh, theme song, which he goes on to do with the help of uh, Paul Mann and Stefan Weiss. And Paul Mann's daughter, Lindy Kahn, who lives in, uh, she's an educational consultant in Houston. Uh, I managed to track her down. And between her and me and Ruth's sister, Mickey, we were able to basically reproduce what had happened. And essentially, it's Sinatra in 1943, he calls up uh, Ruth and says, hey, Ruthie, it's Frankie. I need you to write me a song. And she goes, a song, Frank? What, what do you want? And you can practically see him you know, busting his, his chest out. He says, CBS is giving me my own radio show, and they want me to have a theme song. And she oh, that's wonderful. OK, so uh, what are you thinking for the mood? And he goes, the mood? I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, it's going to be the beginning or the end. Maybe it'll be the end of the show, and maybe we should do something about dreams. You know, I used to say sweet dreams to people. But anyway, Ruth, you're, you're good. Let's hear from up or something. And she goes, okay, well, Frankie, leave it with me. When do you want this for? And he says, well, that's the problem. The problem? Yeah, we need it for tomorrow. She goes, tomorrow? No, no. Frank, I can't write a song for tomorrow. And he said, well, they just told me about this and I need it. And by the way, you told me you wrote I'll Never Smile Again in a night. And she said, yeah, but that was different. He said, anyway, I got to run. There's so much to do. Call me tomorrow. I'll click. And that's it. She's, she's left going, I have to write the theme song for the biggest talent in the land, the, the biggest singer worldwide, for a show that's going to be listened to all the time on the radio by millions of people, and I have to turn this around overnight. <laughs> I'm glad we haven't actually gave given the name yet because people will recognize it when they when they hear it. Let's listen. Put your dreams away for another day, and I will take their place. In your heart. Yeah, put your dreams away. Um, yeah, how do you, I mean, we, we should point out, I should point out that for I'll Never Smile Again, Ruth wrote the words and the music. Yeah. This, she needed help from a couple of those musicians you mentioned. Yeah, tell us, tell me a little bit more about how they, how they manage this in one night. Well, I mean, for her to do it on her own one night was virtually impossible. So she calls up a, a couple of friends. She's very well known at this point in Tin Pan Alley in the famous Brill Building. She calls up a couple of buddies of hers, Paul Mann and Stefan Weiss. And she knows that these guys are always writing songs together. 
And if one of them, if it doesn't click, maybe if the words aren't quite right, or right. the tune's not quite right, they put it on the shelf. And her hope is that they might have a tune on the shelf. So she calls them up. Paul says, well, actually, let me play this thing. We've been playing around with this thing. He plays it and says, look, it's not all there, but it's the beginning of something. Ruth, he says, I love it. Uh, I've been playing around with a few lyrics. Um, come on over, guys. We're going to pull an all-nighter. We're going to do this. And that's what they did. The three of them worked literally all night. And the next morning, just for noon, she calls Frank and says, Frank, listen to this. They put the, uh, the uh, phone on the piano soundboard, and Ruth sings and plays the piano. She's not a singer, by the way, but she had a serviceable voice, shall we say. And um, she does the song. And then there's this pause. And she looks at the guys and goes, he hates it. And all of a sudden, Sinatra says, I love it. Play it again. It's wonderful. I knew you'd come through. And so for the second time in her short life, she has linked her career to that of the biggest performer in the world. Well, look at this. I mean, it bears, it bears a, a bold face type. This young woman, before she was 35, mm -hmm. had bookended... Frank Sinatra's career, his first enormous hit, and his last. The, yeah. I mean, not that that not that "Put Your Dreams Away" was a hit, but the last song. It's the it's 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 the last. It you know it was played at Frank's funeral. It was played at Ruth's funeral as well. They they both had that to uh, to share. She died at uh, age sixty seven in nineteen eighty one, uh, before her time, but. Uh, but her son, Tom Sandler, who helped me with the book, Tommy told, and he was called Tommy by his mom after Tommy Dorsey, how cool is that? Tommy told me that the last song they played at her funeral was I'll Never I'll Put Your Dreams Away. Incredible. Yeah. Um, you talked about the, the, the hoopla in New York for Ruth during the early 40s with the, you know, with that song being so, with, uh, you know, I'll Never Smile Again being huge. But she, she didn't, she got tired of it, it seems, and went back home. Well, you know, Tony, I think at the end of the day, she was still pretty much a uh, small town girl from Toronto, which in those days was much less sophisticated than New York City. And um, as much as she had the gift of the gab and she was good looking and she knew how to do autograph sessions and interviews and stuff, I think she found it all a little overwhelming because she was constantly in demand. And so as 194, and then she finishes this fabulous uh, theme song for Frank. And at that point she said, you know what? Um, I, I've kind of had all this craziness. It's been wonderful. I'll never forget it, but time to go home. And so she and her uh, sister Mickey packed up, moved back to Toronto and literally in November of that year, she found love and remarried. She married Nat Sandler, a uh, financier, had two wonderful sons and a fabulous life. She became a, a, a chatelaine, a, a, a charity worker, a traveler, uh, had a marvelous life, but died too soon. And she wasn't entirely forgotten. Uh, this Is Your Life used to be a big television program in right. the country and they, she was once, you know, had her life reviewed on This Is Your Life. She did indeed, yeah. It was a huge show back then, back in the 1960s. Ralph Edwards was the uh, producer and the host. And yeah, he would bring people into the studio and suddenly say, hey, this is your life. And all sorts of people from the individual's past would mm -hmm. come up. Sure. So uh, yeah, her son said, we were just young kids. They flew them down to LA from uh, Toronto and her sister. And um, Ruth famously said, by the way, when she was surprised, oh, had I known, I would have had a bleach. <laughs> she was worried about her hair color. Yeah. <laughs> Only Ruth would say something to her. Well, it, it, she, as you say, she finally found love and a, and a, and a, and a happy uh, life after the songs yep. and two sons. And she also became well-known, at least among her friends, for uh, her knitting skills. And you're wearing one of them, aren't you? I am indeed. Uh, she, Ruth was a very generous lady. So her son, Tommy, told me if 
if anybody ever did something nice for her, she would send them a black cardigan sweater. And when Tommy read my final uh, manuscript for the book, Until I Smile With You, he said, Mom would be thrilled with this. And I can tell you, you would have received the black cardigan sweater. Well, I went out and bought my own sweater. I'm wearing it now. And anytime I do an interview or a public presentation or anything else about the book, always wear the sweater. Makes me think of Ruth. And Tony, I got to tell you, I'm not overly spiritual, but um, occasionally I'd be writing away here at my desk and something would sort of bug me out. And how do I phrase this? And it was as though Ruth was standing over my shoulder. The, the muse would suddenly happen and off we'd go. So I felt that uh, she was probably part of the book and I think she would have been very happy with the way we covered her life. Because before this, she's not been written about at all. People didn't really know who she was. And yet she's one of the most enduring 20th century musical talents. Well, you picked a perfect muse, Peter. And, uh... And you tell a great story until I smile at you. Um, Thank you, Tony. The Ruth, Thank you. The Ruth story. Thank you, Peter. It's been a delight. Tony, it's been a delight for me to be with you. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate it. Within my heart, I know I will never start to smile again. Till I smile at you Until I smile at you